Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter No, it's a pleasure to finally speak with you, too. It's been actually quite a pleasure following you for the last couple of years. Yeah, likewise. Has it been that long? <laughs> I want to say, because this show's been running for about a little over two years, I think. Maybe so. I want to say when I first started, I was just searching around for other people doing Schumacher-related projects, and that's when I first saw you online. I think it was like a few weeks after that that we finally chatted about something. I don't remember which one, but it was while you were doing one of your screenings. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I did the whole retrospective, mm -hmm. which I called Schumacher Attack mm. and tribute, you know. It's nice yeah. to mm -hmm. connect with you for this one, you know. You guys are the only ones who have been doing what you've been doing. I'm the only one who's doing what I was doing. So it really feels like this is the right thing for us to do together. So let's go ahead and, and jump in. It's Noel here again, being joined as always by Angie. Hello, everybody. Sadly, Joel Schumacher has now passed away. It was June of 2020. And we're just going to record some thoughts here in tribute to him. And we're being joined by a special guest, Rebecca. And Rebecca, you want to tell people about yourself? Hi, uh, yeah. I'm Rebecca Nicole Williams. You guys can call me Nikki. Long story short, I grew up around cinemas and theatres. My father was in that sort of business. And so I was exposed to all this great culture from a very early age. As time went by, I moved to London. I lived in the shadow of Wembley Stadium. And I attend a lot of repertory cinema. And there came a point in my life when I thought, well, there's certain filmmakers who were popular and made mainstream films when I was growing up. Films that I'd like to see on the big screen again, particularly in their native formats. I'm a big exponent of 35mm. I put myself together, a little operation known as the Celluloid Sorceress. And so since 2016, I've been curating film events, mainly in London, but also in other places around the country, Bradford and Brighton. And I've shown Joel's films in all three of those cities. We connected because we were looking for other people online doing our research. And it's yeah. to do with Joel Schumacher. When you find somebody with a common interest like that, certainly I will usually reach out or say, let's have a conversation and start an ongoing dialogue about it. And mm -hmm. That's why it's so great to be here today. What can I say? Joel is no more. What was it that led you to want to spotlight Joel's films? <laughs> Where to begin? <laughs> My Joel Schumacher fandom goes all the way back to the 80s. I mean, the first film that I saw of his in the theatre was The Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. Sure. But that's not to say that I wasn't aware of his films before that. I just didn't necessarily put a name on them. The Incredible Shrinking Woman and DC Cab, which mm -hmm. was called Street Fleet yeah. over here in the UK. <laughs> okay. The first one I saw in the theatre was The Lost Boys, which was a 15 certificate. And it was the first 15 certificate film that I saw legitimately at the age of 15. And it was very exciting. At that point, I was very much captivated by the Panavision widescreen format. And Lost Boys is a great widescreen film. Yeah. But I also remember clocking the name Joel Schumacher and thinking, that's an unusual name, Schumacher. What kind of a name <laughs> is that? Joel is, well, now he's getting all these tributes. And I might go off on one and curse a little bit later on. <laughs> about all these tributes that are now pouring out. that just seem to come out of one side of people's mouths. Yeah. For so many years. Joel Schumacher was the Lost Boys and Batman. And that was it. That was all he was remembered for. He was dismissed for his visual technique and the way he could work in any genre, the way he could try his hand and he had that dexterity to move in and out. The fact that really he was only being remembered for two films. You know, the Lost Boys plays all the time and it does a very good business. It's one of the films that you know is going to sell. But then on the other hand, if you Googled his name, all you would really see is Joel Schumacher killed Batman. You know, mm -hmm. Joel Schumacher, worst director ever. You know, Batman and Robin, one of the worst films ever. First thing I wanted to see is films in the theatre again. They're incredibly visual. The big screen is 
the best way to see them. It doesn't matter which one it is, really. You know, there's big visuals going through all his work from St. Elmo to grand Panavision production design of that and the Batman movies. I mean, even Cousins has the whole wedding dance sequence. Well, yeah, I think I'm a big <laughs> fan of that as well. Yeah. I love Joel Schumacher. <laughs> but I mean, I watched Cousins the other day, and particularly when we screened this on 35mm at the mm-hmm. Regent Street Cinema. The amount of colour that he gets in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know it's all source lighting and Ted Danson's apartment is meant to be opposite this Chinese restaurant and there's a mm. flashing light of the dragon. But yeah. when you get to those nighttime scenes when he's floating around the apartment and things are going wrong in his marriage. But yeah, the scenes where it's all lit with these blues and greens and reds rather than just a conventional lighting arrangement. But then you've got movies like Phone Booth. We've got the Grisham movies. Time to Kill is extraordinarily well shot. And Joel just has this command of visual elements, which obviously, you know, you can trace all the way back to his time studying design at Parsons and his aesthetic in window display that I just felt for a really long time was getting missed. It wasn't fair to say, oh, Joel Schumacher, he made some decent movies, you know. And so now the tributes come out, they're going, oh, yeah, well, we did Phone Booth and Phone Booth is a good... It's like, yeah, Phone Booth is a great movie. Oh, yeah, he did The Client and The Client's the best of the Grisham adaptations. But back when I started doing the retrospective in 2018, you Google Joel Schumacher and all you found was Batman and Robin, the worst movie ever. I still think that that was incredibly unfair. And it's good that with his passing, he's had his five minutes of tributes (laughs) from people... (laughs) Tim Roby, I'm going to name Tim because I know Tim. Uh, He's a Telegraph film critic. And he sent me a really nice message, actually, the day after. You know, I treated him like I'm thinking of you today. Because everybody on the film scene in this country knows Nicky Williams, Joel Schumacher. He said, I probably trashed all his movies, but he was one of a kind. And we owe him that. Mm. I thought that was very gracious. And I found some of his reviews since and tweeted him and said, yes, actually, Tim, you did trash this movie, didn't you? (laughs) But equally, I've seen some really sniffy comments. I mean, I remember io9 even just literally, Joel Schumacher, the man who put nipples on the bat suit, died. Well, if any site's going to do it, it's going to be io9. They're notoriously awful in terms of being nasty. Yeah. The real film fans are coming out. People who know how to sit and appreciate popular entertainment are coming out and saying, you know, there was more to the man than that. You cannot reduce Joel Schumacher's entire career to the Batman movies. If all you've got to say is Batman forever, then, you know, blank you kind of thing. And I've seen a few of that. But this is what Jeff Andrew, Jeff Andrew is the programmer at large of the British Film Institute. I think this was really tasteless, really in bad faith. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. He said, OK, let's be honest. It's sad Joel Schumacher is no longer with us. R.I.P. I had to interview him once for the Cannes premiere of the deeply meretricious reactionary falling down. He seemed perfectly nice. But a good filmmaker? I think not. Be honest in what you write in memoriam. This is a man who's just made up for the closure of the BFI for the last three months with a special sight and sound all based around Jean-Luc Godard. Mm-hmm. So there's plenty of people out there who are sort of tearing him a new one for that. Mm. Really? Yeah. Really? Why would you say something like that? I felt the kind of same kind of way about Tony Scott. I was championing Tony you know, back in the late 90s. You know, I'd be like, Joel Schumacher's a good director. Tony Scott's a good director. And I'd get told by the more pretentious people that I knew, no, no, rubbish, American commercial rubbish, terrible filmmaking, not art. And of course, Tony Scott, since then, he's had his day. There's been this huge Tony Scott revisionism. You know, it's got past true romance. But then, of course, you know, years later, Chris Nolan goes, ah, oh, Tony Scott was a big influence on Dunkirk. And so everyone's going back going, hmm, The Hunger. I remember when The Hunger came out. I remember when The Hunger cost Tony Scott his job on Starman. I remember The Hunger being a cult item for years. But it's amazing how these filmmakers were rediscovered or reappraised over time. Yeah. Tony Scott and yeah. Joel Schumacher, and I said this in most of my introductions, they redefined the lexicon of cinema and the lexicon of television. Because if you look at television and how it developed from late 90s onwards, sort of in the wake of The Sopranos and shows like CSI and 24, and the way television became very cinematic, mm-hmm. they're all using techniques and stylings borrowed from filmmakers like Tony Scott and Joel Schumacher. So to disregard Joel Schumacher as not being a good filmmaker because you don't like his work or because the film snob wants to think of themselves as having a higher intellect. Somebody else I know, our friend Sheldon Hall, and he's a good friend. He's the first one to admit he doesn't like any movies really made after 1970. <laughs> 
We met Schumacher once at a press conference. They were trying to whisk him out, but Schumacher stopped to answer his questions. And it was to do with one of the Grishams, the client, I think. Somebody asked him a question about the Pelican Brief and Alan Pakula. Uh, he said, oh, a real director. And my friend Sheldon says, you know, I like a director who knows his limits. Now, I've seen Sheldon squirm through my 70 millimeter screen in flatliners. <laughs> and he's going, eh, 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 sorry. But did Joel know his limitations? Yeah, I think he did. But did Joel have those limitations? No, Joel was one of the most semi-literate filmmakers that we've ever seen. If Joel had wanted to make high art, Joel was capable of making high art. He just didn't want to. He wanted to make pop art. Yeah. And in the same way all pop artists from Lichtenstein onward took their criticism, so has Joel Schumacher. Will he be revisited in 10 years' time? I don't know. We'll see. I hope so. Hopefully what I've done and what you guys have done with Schumacast will kickstart that. I mean, how, how are you guys feeling now it's passed? I mean, it's been a rough week for me with it, really. I'm emotional. We had already seen, unfortunately, that he was enjoying his retirement, but it is sad to know that definitively we're never going to see another film from him. 80 years is certainly a great long life. I hope to live as long. But, you know, it would have been really nice to see just one more what he could have done because he was the type of guy that was willing to do anything, you know, any genre. Yeah, maybe it wasn't the high art that some people wanted, but any genre, he was going to go for it. He was going to put his spin on it. It was going to look gorgeous, at least. I really admired that about him. And it's sad that we'll definitively never see that again. Yeah. And for me, it's more just like, I'll never get to have lunch with the guy. Because I always yeah. hear about everyone who just loved having lunch with him and talking to him. Mm. My biggest regret is that I'm never going to ask him about that weird glass and steel bee-shaped honey dish from the killer bees. Because <laughs> I want to know where that came from. And that's always going to haunt me that I'll never get to ask him. What can I say? He, he was pretty out there. He was one of a kind. Yeah. He really was one yeah. of a kind. I always saw him as having a very subversive attitude. You know, he liked to push buttons as is demonstrated by some of his films. Yeah. One of the most interesting bits of the Schumacher Attack program I did was when I screened Falling Down and A Time to Kill mm. in the same week. Ooh. And counterpointed against each other with those themes was really interesting to see. Yeah. I was re-listening to your own Schumacher cast on Falling Down the other day. And, you know, there's still a lot of discussion about that. And I don't believe it's a reactionary film. I believe it was a prophetic film. I think Joel is well aware of how uptight white America can be, and certainly in this day and age. When I introduced the film a couple of years ago, and it sold out, that did really good business. Mm. I had to talk about the fact that it is a film that's held up by the far right as mm. he's our hero. And I like to tell the story about when I met Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas came to London. You know, I had a little bit of money at the time. I was organizing a screening of Romancing the Stone and the Jewel of the Nile, and I'd become acquainted with Mike Ellis, who's the editor of The Jewel of the Nile. I tried reaching out to Michael Douglas, but it was hopeless. He's just dealing with CAA, all of that. So I thought, well, I'd quite like to meet him. So I'll spend my silly money and go and see this show and have my photograph taken. And of course, you get 20 seconds with him. But Mike Ellis was like, tell him I said hello. We got on well, kept in touch for a few years. And it was, it was nice to meet him. And he was very gracious towards me in the time that we had. But he waited in this queue and a few people ahead of me. There is the guy in the combat boots and the camouflage jacket. And he looks very mm. nervous. He looks like your definition of an incel. So he looks nervous. You know, he's like popping around on one foot and sort of anxious to meet his hero. And of course, Michael Douglas is old Hollywood. Now he's got the manner. When they release these photographs, they all look the same. The same pose with the same smile. Sure. Apart from the fact that, you know, in some of them, he seems to be enjoying himself a little bit more than others. And in mine, he seemed to have taken a step forward and looked very earnest, which is because I'd said, Mike Ellis says hello. And he's like, how's Mike? And I'm like, Mike's good. He's in North London. He's still working. And we started talking about Mike to the point where the photographer's going, turn on the camera. Come on. <laughs> but this guy who's a few people ahead in the queue, he gets to Michael Douglas and he's like, oh, Mr. Douglas, I'm such a big fan. And Falling Down is my favorite fan because defense, he really tells it like it is. He's really my hero. I would be absolutely right. That movie was so bang on. And of course, you can just see this fixed smile on Mike Douglas's face. He's, mm, well, thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> And so when I was introducing the film, I was telling this story and saying, this film has been misappropriated by the far right. This film is about the far right. It's about how seemingly decent guys, they can harbor all these prejudices and these bigotries and 
Just as I was saying that, some guy in like jack boots and combat gear walked past me to get to his seat. So I don't know how those comments were received. <laughs> I don't just necessarily see films like Falling Down and A Time to Kill as being sort of agitational. You know, let's push some buttons and see who reacts and how and why. I kind of see Schumacher as being like that as a person. I mean, I'm with you. I'd, you know, I'd love to have a lunch with him. I said, it's just a knowledge that I'll never get to say thank you. Yeah. I did think the whole Schumacher attack thing started to come about because I kind of decided that I wanted to go to Los Angeles and research the locations and maybe if I could get the budget together to make a film about the making of Falling Down and the impact. He's not as easy to reach out to. He just seemed to have a wall of agents around him. But I wish I'd tried harder. I really wish I'd tried harder just to have that one conversation. Nothing in particular I wanted to ask him. Yeah. I got a really nice email from Paul Vickery, the head programmer at the Prince Charles Cinema. He said, Joel Schumacher passed away and I immediately thought of you. And I'm sure this is a big loss for you. He said, and I saw your comment that uh, you never have the chance to thank him in person. He said, but I just wanted to reach out to you and say that you did thank him. Your programming thanked him. Oh, that's what programmers like him do. Mm -hmm. I was really touched by that. I know he didn't read the reviews. I mean, who would when you get the reviews that he got? But I'm sure he quite enjoyed his nefarious reputation. But I wonder if he didn't know that there were people like me and like you guys who were looking at his career as a whole to give it the exposure that it's long been overdue. I wonder if he knew. Yeah. And I'm sure if he did, then he got a kick out of it. You know, it still seems to be me and you guys being the only ones who haven't just gone, oh, well, today we're going to talk about the Batman movies or today we're going to look at the legacy of the Lost Boys. I mean, St. Elmo's Fire takes a good kick in every now and then. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure now there'll be pieces written about phone booths or mm -hmm. flatliners. Peter Bradshaw of The Guardian wrote a really nice tribute where he questions whether or not Schumacher inadvertently triggered the whole emo thing <laughs> with flatliners. Noam Gleibelin's piece in Variety was a really nice piece as well. I mean, I think one of the interesting things is Phantom of the Opera, which I still haven't even seen. We're doing that one in mm, October, yeah, I think. Okay. It's a very widely trashed film, but it's also got this whole legion of fans, a lot of whom were young, and that was their first Phantom of the Opera. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to be said for films that have that divisive quality to them, where some people are just so put off by them, and some people are just like, oh my god, I love it, that's the best thing. One of the reasons I started this show was I still hadn't seen a lot of this stuff. A lot of this stuff right. I'm seeing for the first time through this show. Because I had mm -hmm. seen the Batmans, I had seen Phone Booth, I had seen The Client. Joel was just always a director who, his whole filmography looks so interesting and is full of all these things I hear people talk about. And I'd love mm -hmm. to actually just start working through them. And honestly, the journey has lived up to that desire to explore it. I mean, that's really interesting to hear you say that. Is it, well, this is new to you. I mean, I'd seen like The Wiz and Incredible Shrink Woman as children, but I never mm -hmm. revisited them as an adult. Sure. This show was my first time seeing The Lost Boys, even. This was my first time oh, seeing my Falling God. Down. And even just the odds and ends like Cousins and Tigerland and Flawless, where it's like, even if they're not the strongest movies, there's always something interesting about him. He's always finding something Absolutely. either emotionally interesting or atmospherically interesting. He's always come up with odd little ways to play with style. And honestly, I think that's kind of my big overall thought on Joel is I remember when we did our very first episode when we were talking about his costume designs, he said mm -hmm. one of the biggest defining things of his career is that he's someone that people took chances on. And I think taking a chance is like the ultimate definer of Joel Schumacher is he took a chance yeah. when he went to Hollywood. He took a chance when he directed his first film. And so many of his films are odd projects that he took a chance on. And again, his refusal to be pigeonholed with a single tone or style or genre, right. like he followed yep. Lost Boys with Cousins, which is like the complete 180. <laughs> and yet he always took each film as a challenge. He had a good eye for really interesting material. Again, like finding scripts like Falling Down in 8mm, which were making the rounds in Hollywood for years as dangerous films that nobody wanted to take a chance on. And he was like, hey, I'll take that chance. Yeah. His delight in taking risks and his delight in experimenting and his delight in always trying something new. Mm -hmm. I love filmmakers who do that. Yeah, absolutely. What was the first Schumacher film you saw, Angie? Oh, goodness. 
you know, it's hard to say. Probably Incredible Shrinking Woman for sure. Like, mm. technically, that's the first one. I certainly didn't know it was Joel Schumacher, but I grew up with that one. It played on TV a lot in the 80s, yeah. Yes, I think we may have even recorded it, you know, and put it in the VCR every now and again. I have so many vivid memories of that garbage disposal scene scaring me so mm. much as a child. And then I know I did eventually see Lost Boys. I didn't see it in the theater, but probably on TV eventually. And other people may diss it, but Batman Forever is the one that I genuinely love to this day. It's quirky. It's silly. But that's the one that gives me the warm nostalgia feelings. You know, I really love that. It was an interesting thing that happened that because I think it was the 20th anniversary or 25th anniversary of Batman Forever. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people were suddenly going, hey, Batman Forever's not that bad. And I'm thinking like, yeah, guys, like, I'm not saying it's a masterpiece of filmmaking, yeah. but there's some good stuff in there. And it Release was- the Schumacher cup. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I mean, I was happy to see that. And then, of course, you know, then he passes away and some people are going to be ugly still and talk about that. But, you know, talk about somebody being willing to push buttons. Yeah, you remember those bat nibbles because he went for it. He didn't care if it was going to disturb you or not. He thought that was what he wanted to do. And he did it, you know? So, yeah, you remember it. Joel doesn't just take risks. He swings for the fences. Yes, exactly. I remember they were interviewing him about his window display work for Mm -hmm. Endos. Mm -hmm. He was talking in detail about that, about how some of his displays had been real shockers and had really upset the establishment. There was one he did with a dummy hanging himself. There was one where they put this smashed pane of glass inside the window, sort of doubled up a glass to make it look like there'd been some sort of invasion. Somebody had broken in, smashed through the window and climbed in. And all the dummies were posed in these like terrified poses, like they were recoiling in horror from whatever was coming through the window. Wow. He was telling these stories with this glint in his eye and this smirk on the face and the audience of young people laughed. He questioned himself. He was like, this is all very darkly humorous stuff, you know. So he's meant to be selling clothes and ladies wear. (laughs) That's one thing I always wish I could do is take time to start digging through all the old newspapers and magazines from New York around that time just to see Mm -hmm. if you could find any photo spreads of those window displays of a lot of the costume lines that he worked for, which would be hard to do because I don't know how much they would have attributed it to him. Yeah, probably not. I've done some Google searching, but you can only go so far with that. As far as I know, I'm the first person who actually created an archive of his costume design work, you know, with those Mm. spreads that I did on Tumblr, which are still out there. And if you go to our first episode, you can still find links to all of them. I'm glad I watched those films just to kind of like find like the trends that define Joel throughout all these things. And it's like they're Mm. slick, but also super wearable and down to earth unless they get super flamboyant. And that's always the character you want to pay attention to, you know, and he loved his wingtip collars, (laughs) loved his turtlenecks. Well, it was 70s, so that makes sense. (laughs) His knit sweaters. Oh, God, his knit sweaters. But no, and it's 70s fashion design that you could still see people wearing to this day. Mm. You can't always say that about 70s fashion design. No. It has an earthy feel to it, but it's also still Mm -hmm. super clean. It's very well cut, well tailored. And that's been the big thing is what are the through lines for Joel? And it's not just like fashion or visuals, but I think one of the big things Mm -hmm. is... I think there's a reason why he became an actor's director. A lot of actors love working with him because in Mm -hmm. the same way that he likes to take risks, he likes to have actors that take risks and allow them the freedom to, hey, you want to go for it for this scene? You go for it. Yeah. I mean, I love the tweet that Minnie Driver. That was fantastic. Her memory about how someone was making fun of her for being too over the top in Phantom of the Opera. She describes Joel as without even looking up from his New Yorker, he said to that person, oh, honey, nobody ever paid to see Under the Top. (laughs) Nice. I mean, I even love bits like someone was asking him, so what's the meaning behind all these pictures you have on the walls of Chase Meridian's office? And he says, it means we had a blank wall and we wanted to put something there. (laughs) (laughs) And I like that there's this blunt honesty to him while there is also a lot of thought. His films don't feel like they're ever overthought. They feel Mm -hmm. slightly impulsive, but also, hey, let's try this and see what happens, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's not like he spent weeks stewing on the production design. It's kind of like, no, he probably had a bunch of people pitch stuff to him. and was like, oh, that looks nice. Just add this. Mm -hmm. I think you'd get that from working in the fashion industry in the 60s, where it's like you had to churn out stuff on a pretty quick level. So it's like you have to bring your thought, you have to bring your creativity, but you also have to get Mm -hmm. stuff out on time. And Joel was always known for also being super punctual 
and professional mm-hmm. and never really went over budget, never went over his shooting schedules. Yeah. And people enjoy working with him. Yeah. Yeah. There's a story going around by Paul Hirsch where there's one shot him falling down that's out of focus. It's when defense is on the phone trying to get through the Barbara Hershey. And there's the long tracking shot of him, single take of him on the phone. They shot a few times and they wrapped up and nobody noticed they was out of focus until after it was done. And somebody had to go and tell him. <laughs> it sounds like he wasn't a man who took bad news well. <laughs> so apparently he went, why didn't you tell us? Because you don't take bad news that well, Joel. But equally, you know, he is the one who defended Jim Carrey yeah. on the set of Batman Forever mm-hmm. against the ego of Tommy Lee Jones and also had <laughs> yeah. Val Kilmer up against the wall for behaving like jackass. And even then, Val Kilmer still, someone tweeted a quote from his memoir of just saying some really lovely things about Joel. Mm. I remember once when we were chatting, you told me the story about one of the guys who played one of the golfers on Falling Down. Oh, Jack Betts. You know, Joel kind of blew up at him when he revealed on set that, oh, yeah, I can't actually play golf. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I was like, on the one hand, I kind of get that because, you know, you hire a guy for it. But then it also still says right. a lot that Joel still had him in that scene, didn't replace him, and continued <laughs> to work with him on other films afterwards. Well, Jack's a friend. Jack's in five of his films. Yeah. Jack met Joel through acting class. Joel used to keep going to acting class. I suppose because he wanted to develop his understanding of performance Mm, and also cruising for talent. And I mean that in both senses. (laughs) (laughs) Jack's just come out after many, many years in the industry. You know, I asked him about Joel. He said what had really made Joel stand out to him. You know, Joel spoke very eloquently about how it had been for him to be a gay man in the film industry. Mm -hmm. Joel was revolutionary in being openly gay. Mm -hmm. He acted like there was not a care in the world. I'm sure he had many cares about it. Certainly, it didn't ever seem to work against him. This had resonated with Jack, so they struck up a conversation, and that was how he came to be in a falling down. Mm. But yeah, he he plays golf, he plays one who has a heart attack, and he said he did get on set, and Joel's like, you need to get a five iron for this scene. (laughs) Jack's like, what's that? He's like, what do you mean, what's that? You're going to be playing golf. And Schumacher blew up at him, but Mike Douglas stepped in, and showed Jack a few golf moves, and they got the scene, and it's a very memorable scene. Yeah. I think that definitely says a lot, too, about Joel as a person is he was unapologetically who he was and was always open about it, like wildly open about it with that Vulture interview. But he was never ashamed of who he was. And he didn't allow the industry to paint him in a corner, too. That's one thing I really respect. And I think part of that also Mm -hmm. drove why he took chances and did as many different types of films as he could so that he would never get painted into a corner. Yeah. Circling back to the beginning about why we started this all is one of the biggest issues I have with the Batman legacy is how so many people hold against him these two films that, one, are Mm -hmm. not really bad. They're not great. They have their issues, but they're not terrible movies. Mm -hmm. And two, that they use these two things to define an entire career when those two things very much stand out from what the rest of that career was like. Yeah. He was reliable. And you can use the word journeyman without it being an insult, I think. He was a consummate professional, as you said. He never went over budget. He never went over schedule. And he delivered the goods. And he was Warner Brothers' go-to person until Batman and Robin. Now, I actually remember my experiences of Batman and Robin coming out. And I was really excited. And it was one of the first movies to have its own website. Mm. And hyping all my friends up like, oh, Sunday afternoon opening, we've got to go and see Batman and Robin. <laughs> so we'll all go down there. There's about half a dozen people with me. We sat back and the film started. And within about 10 minutes, I realized that everybody I was with were just staring at me. (laughs) What the hell is this? What are we watching? Oh, my God. What have you brought us to? Uh... So that kind of ruined my first experience of Batman and Robin. And it wasn't until I revisited Batman and Robin. I think Joel did himself a disservice by apologizing. There are people who work in the film industry and direct major movies that are terrible. And they're still working. Joel sort of went, oh yeah, I ruined Batman. Warner Brothers gave him a mandate. Tone it down, make it lighter, tie it in with the spin-offs and the merchandise, make it family friendly. He made a perfectly decent kids version of Batman. There's an article kicking around at the minute, I think it's in the New York Times, about how Joel Schumacher saved Batman, which he did, because Mm -hmm. it was the lowest budgeted Batman film. And Batman Returns might be hailed now as a masterpiece, as one of Tim Burton's greatest films. It certainly wasn't in 1992. Yeah. The critics hated it. The audience hated it. 
Batman returns, left Warner Brothers not knowing what to do, and they gave it to Schumacher, who was proven to have a commercial sensibility, wasn't necessarily going to go too dark or too arty, knew how to bring the colour to it, reinvented. I was really excited when Schumacher got the Batman gig, and it made however many hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. and saved the franchise. Batman and Robin may have been enough. I can't remember. It didn't even bomb. It still did financially well. I'm sure it did. If you look at the big reinventions of the Batman franchise, Joel Schumacher's contribution was every bit as important to that franchise as Chris Nolan's. By Flatliners. Flatliners was a film that got written off over time. Grand pack rubbish, foolishness. And it's one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Both times I've seen that movie play, people came out going, you know, that film's actually pretty good. And it's like, what, didn't you believe it? Oh, I just read a few <laughs> articles saying that these were the worst films ever made and Schumacher was a hack. You know, like Cousins, they didn't pull a big audience. But everybody who came out, a friend of mine who's another curator, he messaged me and saying, you know, no BS. Hands down, that was my favourite experience of the year. I'm hoping we're going to get a few of the ones that I didn't get to do up on the screen now. Yeah, what are some of those? I had a double bill plan of Tigerland and phone booths, and that got cancelled due to lack of sales. I didn't do the client, which I'd like to see, because I never saw that in the theatre. I'd like to do The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Yeah, that'd be a great one to see in a theatre with all the big polyester visuals. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The ones I did do, I, I did 10. I did a digital screening of DC Cab. That'd be fun to see with the crowd. Yeah, it went down really well. It was just in a small little boutique screen at the Cinema Museum. I would just love to hear the audience during the, sorry ma'am, wrong house scene. <laughs> right. Which is, to this day, my favorite laugh line of all Joel Schumacher's films. That and the scientists in Batman and Robin who see the death ray coming towards them are like, it's one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did Dying Young. That was where you probably heard me on the Hoxton radio. And I went on and argued about it being a baroque fantasy of love and death, which it is. I mean, it's pure fairy tale. You look at the cinematography and some of that. It's all about toxicity and this abusive relationship. It's far more complex than it was given credit for. I did Time to Kill. I did Sparkle. I never got a cinema release in the UK. It went straight to video. So to be able to screen it for what looks like the last remaining 16mm print, which is mine, I own it. And it was a well-attended screening. I did an on-stage discussion around it with some archive clips of Joel talking about it. As we kind of wrap things up here, I'll start with you, Angie. So what does Joel mean to you? And what does the experience of having gone through his films, at least up to this point, what does that mean to you going forward? I remember thinking at the beginning, oh, well, you know, he's made all this different stuff. Maybe he was just sort of a company man. You know, whatever they wanted, they would go to him. You know, obviously with his under budget and under schedule, that's true to an extent. But it's clear that he also really put a lot of thought into his films and his choices. I guess I just keep coming back to he was a man who wasn't afraid to take chances, who wasn't afraid to explore something different. He was mired down by drug abuse at times in his life, and he got over that, and he became sober. He's like a phoenix, almost. <laughs> he just kept coming back. Those of you who know me know I'm obsessed with the phoenix. What's that? Your tattoo but, of a phoenix? Uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> no, nothing. He lived that, and I really think that's great, and he's a role model. Yeah, he really did live a life and a half, didn't he? <laughs> it occurred to me the other day, I'm, I'm now at the age that Joel was when he directed The Lost Boys. And can I claim to have had such a full life at this age as Joel had had? To sum up, I would have three thoughts. He was one of a kind. He made the kind of film that they just don't make anymore and will probably never make again. He's the kind of filmmaker that we just won't see again. And what does he mean to me? Pure cinema. Pure cinema. You went to see a Schumacher film. It would grab you by the throat, pull you in and entertain the hell out of you. And I'm going to miss him. He's definitely a good definition of where the line is between a journeyman director and a for hire director in that mm. he's literally on a journey. You look at his career and it's a journey of exploring, discovering, challenging himself. Yeah. I always admire filmmakers like that of where he's not just churning out the work, taking whatever scripts are given. He was actively pursuing mm -hmm. and creating yeah. and discovering stuff and an opportunity showed up and he's like, oh, that sounds like it would be fun to do. Let's try it. <laughs> the first film he did as a costume designer was 1972. The first film he did as a director was 1974. So it just took him two years to get to the point where he got to direct his first film. 
And I was like Angie said, he just kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back. Mm -hmm. Even after the number 23, which is a good little movie. He still came back and he did those movies for the video on demand market that were perfectly tailored for the audience that they were pitched at. I still think the film that I wish more people knew about is still Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill. Yeah, I was watching that just yesterday. All you can really find are like some old muddy VHS recordings from TV. That was terrible. Yeah. I'd love to see if someone could find like a nice version that they could even just put out on DVD somewhere. May not be available anymore. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that it's easy to find that you can watch versions. There's just not a good version. Right. Ultimately, I'm just going to say Joel is a director that needs to be more explored. Yep. If you dig into his catalog, and I hate to say ignore the Batman movies, because even the Batman movies, they're so bold and so rich. And again, just swinging for the fences and taking chances. And I appreciate the risks that he took in those movies, even if I have issues with specific things in them. If you dig through his catalog, you're going to find something that's for you. Yeah. There's so many little treasures. And I think people just spend a moment and go look at his IMDb page and then you'll go, oh, oh, he made that. Mm -hmm. Oh, he made that. I think that's the biggest thing is that some of the films that he's done that are well liked, people don't always realize he's the one that directed it. My wish is that we had had more of, I know Shout Factory has started putting out special editions of some of his movies, like their Incredible mm. Shrinking Woman release is wonderful, it has a ton of wonderful interviews on it. They just put out 8mm, which had some great new interviews with Joel. I think those are probably going to be some of the last interviews he ever did. Mm. I wish that we had had some more of these like really packed special editions, because I love all of his commentaries. His commentaries are just a delight. And I wish that we had had more of the stories behind some of these movies. Mm. Yeah, Kino Lorba have got DC Camp coming out at some point before the end of the year. I also just want to give a shout out to Mike White, my friend who does the projection booth, because last year he did this marvelously sprawling Falling Down episode where he actually got to interview Joel. He got to interview Ebby Rose Smith. And that one is just so full of stories and background. There's even a great moment where he brings up Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill and Joel's reaction of pure joy <laughs> that someone was asking <laughs> about it. it was so delightful. That's nice. I was going to recommend the book Lost in the Shadows by Paul Davis. Yeah, it's as comprehensive making of the Lost Boys as you're ever going to get. And Joel and everybody were involved in that. And I saw Paul Davis tweet the other day. He's a filmmaker mm -hmm. himself. And apparently Joel wrote a letter of recommendation to U.S. immigration so that Paul could go and make the films that he's made for Bloomhouse, which is the kind of guy that Joel was. My work around Joel was very much about getting the film seen. So who knows what I'll be able to accomplish. I managed to get Sparkle added to two catalogues. I didn't hear Mark all of his titles to do, but I would certainly like to screen all up to the number 23 if I can. It's just a shame that some titles like DC Cab, you're going to be lucky to find a print of that yeah. now. You can go to the collector's market, but unless you're a collector who's got your own setup at home, they're just going to sit there. Even if I don't get to do any more, I'm certainly very proud of what I did. Yeah. I do just hope that somehow he found out about it and it made him smile. Yeah. You got to put Sparkle into two catalogs and I got to create an IMDb page for Now We're Cooking. So these accomplishments that Joel has inspired for us. <laughs> we did our bit. That's all we can say. Yeah. It's just a little extra nudge that we can do to get people to find these things. And then just on a final note, one thing I want to bring up, people will probably remember that following the DC Cab episode, we did kind of a little spin-off podcast series mm. where JD and I did Barbroians going through all the films of the Barbarian Brothers. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I wanted to give a little shout out to uh, David Paul of the Barbarian Brothers, who did also pass away in March of 2020. Oh. It's always been kind of interesting following him ever since we did that project, because that was such an interesting journey of discovery, because again, we went into it just knowing, yeah, we're going to have like a handful of really goofy movies starring these two identical twin bodybuilders and they ended up being like oddly sweet charming movies with this really good vaudevillian shtick that they would do and we really enjoyed it and i remember angie even showing you and jack yeah. think big no i'm not going to argue they're great movies but they're really fun and they know what they are mm -hmm. and they're just having fun being delightful movies yeah to then learn after they left the industry and they sobered up from all the drugs and all the steroids they were doing and in more recent years have just been trying to find these outlets to explore their own philosophies and artistic expression about how David Paul himself had become this really beautiful carpenter, had built this entire house for himself. You can still find his website that has photos that he became a renowned and award-winning photographer, put out a number of books collecting his photography, even wrote a novel. It just arrived <laughs> in the mail. After he passed away, I visited his website again and tucked in the back was, oh yeah, here's his novel that he wrote that is like, wait, why didn't you tell me about that before? <laughs> <laughs> 
I know Peter has always struggled more with his addictions and illnesses, and David has always explored more of these artistic outlets. And he's another person that I found very inspirational in terms of always taking risks, always trying to find new ways to express himself. Even though he was always kind of heavy handed and fumbly in how he did it, there's such a sincerity and such a heart to so much of the stuff that he did. And it's been fun going back and listening through his YouTube channel, just listening to some of the songs that he did, seeing the photographs. Again, I, I wish that someone would find a way to release Face Street Corner Tavern, which was the semi autobiographical art film that the two brothers made together that did screen at a couple festivals, but has never been widely released other than some mm -hmm. clips of it on YouTube. I would really love to see that stuff. It's kind of sad that we lost both Joel and David at a time when we're already like so emotionally struggling with everything that's going on mm -hmm. in the world. But I still want to just say how much I appreciate everything they've given us, how much it's meant to me to not only watch these films they made, but learn about them over the course of this journey through watching their stuff. Yeah, I'd agree with that, even though I've been following Joel for 30 years. <laughs> no, longer than that. There are still things I find out that I didn't know. Yeah. The biggest thing, I still can't find Codename Foxfire, the TV series that he created and co-produced, which there was a VHS release of the two-hour pilot, but that's like wildly hard to find. There's like a couple of Pakistani websites that are saying, yeah, hey, you can order this. You just can't use PayPal. You got to give us your credit card number. I'm like, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And yeah, it seems like there's a couple of clips on YouTube that nobody's ever posted anything of it. That's been the one episode we've had to skip because I can't even find the pilot. If anyone could find Codename Foxfire, hook me up. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's the only thing that we haven't seen yeah. between us. So we are obviously the biggest fans of Joel Schumacher that ever walked this earth, <laughs> for right or wrong. And I hope that we've paved the way for fans to come. That's my biggest thing, is I'm hoping we're <laughs> setting a stage that for the next people who are curious to learn about Joel, we've given them something that they can look back on and learn about Joel. Sure. I hope so. It's amazing how quickly these movies fall through the cracks. It might seem like yesterday, but when I look at the young people coming through and how interests and attitudes have changed and how a lot of films are being looked at differently, you know, filmmakers like John Hughes, the way all mm -hmm. of a sudden like John Hughes stuff has become problematic, the way a lot of John Landis' stuff has become problematic. Now, I would argue that Schumacher's work is less problematic than films like that. A film like St. Elmo's Fire. It explores the problems as problems. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's a film about self-created drama. It knows its protagonists are assholes. It's really looking at why they're assholes. I think Joel's movies hopefully will age quite well, but only if they're not forgotten. I hate to think that a movie like Sparkle will never be seen properly, mm -hmm. will never be exhibited. Or the work of a great comedian like Lily Tomlin might fall through the cracks just because people don't remember a film like The Incredible Shrinking Woman. And my argument is that cinema as an art form isn't always there to tap the intellect or deal with the issues of the day or been forward thinking enough to say these issues may carry on and be prevalent 30 years from now. You know, I'd hate to think that a movie as good as The Client will just get forgotten. If I've sent half a dozen people away going, Time to Kill, that was a great movie, or Flatliners, they'll introduce those movies to their friends, then hopefully my job is done. His Batman movies and Lost Boys, those will probably live on forever. Yeah. The big thing is that I want to make sure that people don't forget the other stuff. Yeah. I think the internet, it is a huge help in terms of making sure things don't get forgotten. It's definitely better than it was. Right. But a lot of it still gets lost in the, here's the top five, you know, and it's like, well, sure, let's talk about number sure. 13, because that's probably really interesting still. They'll have our podcast to find for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's a good note to end on. Yeah. Nikki, I want to thank you so much for coming out and sharing your stories with us. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. What can I say? I miss the guy. We lose a lot of people when we're fans of culture. Equally, we feel our own mortality. The people that we grow up being fans of pass away and we remember, wow, yeah, Joel was 80 and he did have cancer. But I'm, I'm in mourning. Yeah, same here. And I guess all we could say is, hey, go watch some good Joel Schumacher movies. Yeah. Um, Godspeed, John. What I'd recommend is people go through the list, try to find a movie you've never even heard of before, and just try to be like, hey, let's see what this is, and go discover it. Take a chance yeah. on it. Take a chance. Yeah. He had such a wide variety of work. Find something that's in a genre you know you like and give it a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing about Joel. Give him a chance. Give him yep. a chance. And with that, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.
For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.